NUS Greater Good Series, Mothers on the Fast Track, we would like to invite you to proceed to your seats now as we'll be commencing today's workshop in a couple of minutes. Thank you. Hi everyone. <laughs> Welcome to the NUS Greater Good Series, Mothers on the Fast Track. Um, I would like to now invite Angela Chapman, Director of the NUS Development Office, to introduce the NUS Greater Good Series. Can you please join me to welcome Angela? Good morning and welcome to all of you uh, to this, our inaugural event of the NUS Greater Good Series. Uh, the purpose of the Greater Good Series is really to raise awareness of philanthropy and its impact on society, with a particular focus on Asia. It will feature outreach programs similar to this, raising uh, awareness through talks, conferences and forums by eminent leaders uh, from their respective fields. The talk topics will range all the way from leadership to philanthropy. Uh, we're very grateful to Mr. K.H. Tan, who is our sponsor for this event, who has made a very generous donation to the university for us to carry out these uh, outreach programs. And in addition to that, his gift will also support building capacity at NUS uh, around from philanthropy. Thank you. Uh, we want to thank you again, Mr. K.H. Tan, for your support. And I would like to introduce the chair of our event today, which is Dr. Astrid Tumenez. Uh, Dr. Tumenez is the Vice Dean Research for the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. And uh, she has been working more than two decades in the areas of project management, private equity, philanthropy, research, you name it, I think Astrid has probably done it in the 20 years. And she's currently doing, uh, she's currently the principal investigator in a Rockefeller Foundation funded project on women's leadership in Asia. So without further uh, ado, please Dr. Tumanes, I will ask you to introduce our speaker. Thank you very much, Angela. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. And, uh, you know, my schedule's very busy, but the reason I love doing these kinds of things is actually very selfish. I think women need to constantly get our energy uh, re rejuvenated, and we come to these things to, to be encouraged and to hear narratives and see numbers, to get our own lives and our own uh, career paths deconstructed sometimes by this, by this session. So I'm, I'm really delighted to be here. And um, thank you for mentioning my, my project, Angela, because I'm very excited about that. So it is with great pleasure today that I introduce our speaker, Professor Marianne Mason. She is currently professor and co-director of the Center uh, Economics and Family Security at the University of California, Berkeley School of Law. Her scholarship spans children and family law policy and history. Recent works have focused on working families, in particular, the issues faced by the surging numbers of professional women in law, uh, medicine, science, and the academic world. Dr. Mason's most recent book co-authored with her daughter, who also spoke uh, last year here in Singapore, uh, Ms. Eva Mason Ekman, is entitled Mothers on the Fast Track, How a New Generation Can Balance Family and Careers. And I remain yet to be convinced that this balance <laughs> is possible because I'm constantly standing on my pinky toe and holding five things in the air, and I, I really want to hear how this is done. So without further ado, Professor Marianne Mason. Thank you. I want to thank NUS for inviting me to Singapore and my daughter the year before. Uh, Eve said, you're going to love those Singapore ladies. They're very lively and they have all kinds of great questions. And I learned a lot and you will too. So. <laughs> Actually, I love coming to Singapore in general. I come here probably every four or five years over the past 30 years. And every time it's just a new city. It reinvents itself continuously. This time around there were casinos and a Ferris wheel and Skyline had totally transformed itself and many more green plants. How do you do it? Just amazing. This island just is always different and, and vital and it's a, it's a marvel. We feel so kind of in the United States that we're kind of on the decline but clearly Singapore is not. You are bursting so this is great. Uh, I'm also very interested because although I've studied uh, these issues in terms of working mothers in the United States and to some extent in Europe, uh, I haven't really looked at Asia, and I'm very eager to know uh, if you're experiencing some of the same issues, uh, what kind of research is being done here, so I'm, I'm hoping to, to learn a lot from you today. Um, this project, uh, which we actually call the Do Babies Matter Project, actually began when I became the first graduate woman dean at Berkeley in the year 2000. Um, 
I was actually the only woman dean at Berkeley in the year 2000. Uh, but it was an exciting year because for the first time in history, Berkeley had more than 50% of their entering graduate students were women. And this was a thrill to me, a child of the 70s who was very active from the very beginning. Uh, this, of course, includes not just the PhDs, uh, although we give more doctorates than, let me just put this down, it's my, my could you mind holding this? <laughs> Thanks. Um, we give more doctorates than any other university in the world. At, at, at graduation time, I'm handing out those 900 PhDs madly every time. But it also includes medicine, it includes law, it includes business. In every one of these fields, there has been a huge, you know, come on, it's going to happen. No, come on. And we, you've got to give, no. Well, there you go. It's a good combination. We can, we can contemplate that. We can meditate on it. While she's fixing this, may I just mention that um, Partly this is a talk about the, really the transformation of the American workplace over the past 40 years. Uh, this is a familiar curve uh, to all those in the United States, and I'll bet it's very similar here as well. It starts from the end of the 60s and goes through, in this case, 2000, but if you followed it further, it would go up even further. It's been the incredible, incredible rise of women into basically what were male-dominated professions. The, the doctorate is the dark blue, and the, all the other professions, um, law, medicine, and business is the, the lighter blue. Uh, so we actually have reached parity in terms of going into these professions. Of course, this has been on the landscape of the transformation of the workplace in the United States, perhaps here as well. Women now are equal, equal workers. 50% of all jobs in the United States are held by women. But even more than that, 35% of all families are, are, held, are led by a female breadwinner, 35%. And in those families in which there are two earners, women bring in 44%, and in 20% of the cases, more than their spouse or partner. So the idea of the breadwinner is really still a mental concept, I'm afraid, for men and women as well, but it's not a reality. Women are equal breadwinners in all serious ways in the United States. And this curve represents the rise in the breadwinning community and the need for women. It's not just that they choose to do this and are crazy to do it. A family cannot no longer live on uh, one salary. And I'm sure that's the case in Singapore as well. I mean, my father was an immigration officer. Uh, my mother didn't work. That could not happen in the United States and have any anywhere near a middle class life. So things have changed drastically. And I suspect that's the way of the global world. So here you have this incredible uh, rise in startling rise of the opportunities open to women. I got my degrees down there in the 70s, a PhD, and then after that a JD. And in my class, there were only perhaps 10 or 12% women. And now both of those classes in the universities where I got them have more than 50%. So this is, this is dramatic and important. However, I did look around me at Berkeley because I know not as all exactly as it seems in terms of gender parity. And this is a test. Now, this is the University of California, Berkeley. Any of you been there or know about it? It's a major university, huge, 10,000 employees and whatever. Um, the winner of this test actually gets a Starbucks or your drink of choice. Is it bourbon here or is it beer? Or what, what is the local favorite? Uh, Singapore Sling. Singapore? Oh, there is a Singapore Sling. <laughs> we always drink them. I wasn't sure that they existed here. <laughs> okay. okay, it's either Starbucks or a Singapore Sling. Now you can see the, the figure on the right is kind of masculine with a big head and big shoulders and a tiny neck. And then you've got the woman with the smaller head, the bigger neck, and then a little bit of padding down at the middle-aged bulge there. So what's a guess? Start with the head. That's kind of easy. 987 to 325. This is our campus, University of California, Berkeley. What do you think that might be? Post no, this is the top. Head. The head. Who's at the head? <laughs> no, actually, at Berkeley, it's tenure, it's tenure, yeah, it's tenure, tenure track professors, not even just tenure, tenure track professors. Uh, so they, at Berkeley, about 26% of the faculty are tenure track. Even though 50% of the graduating PhDs are women, they only, they go for a two to one ratio, and that is true across the board. So, see the neck? The neck is probably the most important thing. Uh, the female neck is clearly bigger than the male neck. And what do you think? It's twice as big. What do you think that is? Yeah. 
it may translate. It, it may not translate so well. It's the adjuncts, it's the part-time, it's the faculty who are not tenure track. And it's the fastest growing part of the university world because increasingly we're not hiring tenure track, which are too expensive. We're moving into this second tier, which is under-benefited, generally not very well paid, and has no future. And as you will see, uh, in looking at our research, we decided to look at the effect of family formation on the career lives of men and women PhDs. The major factor which determines whether you're in the head or whether you're in the neck is whether or not you have a baby. So here we go. Uh, and this is a San Francisco law firm which, which actually looks exactly the same. So even though the university looks like it should be a separate entity and run differently, it is the way of the America. It's probably the way of all your corporations as well. You've got big heads at the senior management, and this is largely guys, the necks are going to be thicker and that's going to be middle management, uh, more women than there are in uh and then there are men, and then the bottom will be kind of a mixture of men and women. So the big heads and the little heads are the representation of all the workplaces in America and probably here as well. And the neck, which is the most important part of it, are all the women who put in all those hours and got those degrees and got their PhDs, went into science, went into medicine, and they're not going to be heads. But be the women, can you just go back? Okay, to sure. There are 51. That's quite big. Compared to men, only 21 shareholders. 217. The number slipped down. <laughs> no, no, no. Sorry, my dear. <laughs> Just a bad slide. <laughs> the numbers are regrettably painfully correct. <laughs> And that is just a San Francisco law firm. Uh, so what we and, and started on our project, the Do Babies Matter project, which has been going on now for 12 years. I uh, have a big research team. We're funded by Sloan Foundation initially and now by the National Science Foundation because we're focusing more on women in science. Uh, and the idea was to really look carefully at when and where and how family formation affects the career, in this case, of men and women PhDs. And we started out with a great database because NSF has been collecting information since the 19, late 1960s. And there are 160,000 people in their database and they follow through 10% of them every two years. So we have the best employment database. We were talking about this earlier in terms of having numbers. If you have data, you have power. It allows you to make argument, it allows you to change things, it allows you to make policy. So getting that data is really the first step. NSF had done a lot of it for us, a huge database. We had just to crunch the numbers. And then we did a number of our own original surveys. We surveyed all the faculty in the UC system, 8,000. We surveyed all the graduate students, 9,000. All the postdocs, 10,000. So we have original data as well, and we're able to make very precisely ask questions and answer them about when and how children make a difference in, in the lives of men and women PhDs. And as you can see here, this slide trying to bring it all together in some ways, uh, shows it fairly clearly that the women who have early babies, and in this case early is not very early, it's any time five years post PhD. The average PhD is given at 34 in America. So for any time up to age 40, the average tenure is given at 40 to 41. So it's all the period leading up to tenure are the early babies. The ones after tenure, the later no babies, don't make much difference, but there aren't many of them because after age 40s, we'll see women don't have so many children. That's probably not a surprise to you either, but <laughs> that's certainly the case. So the biggest effect here is on those who have Women who have early babies, they're far more likely disproportionately to go into the neck, to the second tier, to the part-time adjunct class. Women who have later no babies are less likely than men to get tenure, and they're more likely than men to go into the second tier, but far less likely than women. So you see the most significant, we see this in the sciences, we see it literally in every discipline, and you'll see it in the corporate world, you'll see it. They haven't got as good data, but basically the, the trend is there. And it's not a surprise. Babies slow people down and kick them out of the track. The fast track in the academic world is in the ages between 30 and 40, the make or break years. It's it's true in the corporate world, it's true in medicine, it's true in law. That's when you make it as a partner, you make it as an academic. Uh, once you slip out of that track, it's very hard to go back in. So the problem with the second tier, more than anything else, is that it's usually a dead end. Now the most effective 
actually second tier is in medicine. Uh, we have, as I said, a huge number of women go into medicine now. They do end up in a second tier in the sense they're largely primary care physicians, and they make about 40% less than men do. However, it's not a bad second tier. It's got good status, meaningful work. Some of the second tiers are very bad, certainly the adjuncts or the part-time teachers are, because they're running around trying to get work. In the business world, I assume that's that kind of middle management tier where people fall. In the academic world, you don't have any choice. If you don't get tenure, you are truly out. You're out of the university. In the business world, if you kind of slide off the fast track, you slide into kind of a middle level position and you can probably stay there indefinitely, but you probably won't get back on the fast track. You're not going to be the CEO or the CEO. You're going to be there forever. So the, the parallels are not exact, but they're very similar. And if anyone investigated their own uh, profession, they would find that they're strikingly similar. And in terms of universities, many people have done the University of California head next thing that I showed you. And they always send me their pictures and it's enormously uh, <laughs> successful in the sense that it looks alike, <laughs> depressingly alike almost everywhere you go. So this is kind of the major story that we learned. This is compressing years of years of uh, studies and we've got a gazillion publications. If you're interested at all in this, in this topic, just go to my website, Marianne Mason, and you'll be overwhelmed with more than you possibly want to read, and more recently on, on women in science, which you've been focusing on. Overall, men with early babies are 38% more likely than women with early babies to achieve tenure. Single mothers are more successful than married mothers. Now, how can that be? I don't know. <laughs> Truly, the fact is, I don't know. But I have gotten some suggestions over the years. And one that I kind of like is, they only have one baby to take care of at home. <laughs> And that's, uh, the two other things, too. They also don't have much choice. They probably can't drop out of the fast track because they need to stay there. They're, nobody else is going to support them. And in the academic world, you know, America is a very large place, and mobility is very important. So you have to go where the job is, and often mothers are likely to defer to their spouse and go where their jobs are, and therefore get on the second tier. So there are lots of reasons, but single mothers actually do quite a bit better than married mothers. High percentage of mothers slide into the second tier, the part-time adjunct and lecturer core. The gypsy scholars of the university world, I was one of those for two or three years. It means you're going from university to university to try to put together enough work to, to actually support yourself or your family or whatever because you're not really working full time. That's the, wor that's the worst of the second tier. Um, and as I mentioned, the structural reason is that we're still, and I assume it's probably true still in Singapore, operating on a male clock. We think of everything as being front-ended. A career life for everyone is probably at least 40 years, and yet we talk about those first 10 years as being the only time in which you have a chance to make yourself. And if you don't, both professionally or, or reproductively, if you don't make it reproductively, uh, you don't have an opportunity to do it again. And the second part, the reproductive part, is probably even more telling and in some ways uh, upsetting than the fact that women don't continue in the fast track. Those who do continue in the fast track are far less likely to be married with children than are men. Um, this is the University of California, all the faculty, this is one little slide from that. As you can see, that little dotted line is the higher date. And that, those are when people have babies. You can see that men have babies early and often through the graduate school years beforehand. And then through those tenured years, the first uh, of the years in which they're going to t try to obtain tenure, men are having babies all during that period. And then women have one big burst, and that's the year they send their case in for tenure. That's usually four to six years after they, they arrive. Then they go downhill quickly. And surprisingly, men keep on going in terms of fertility. And then there's that little boomlet at the end, 20 years after being hired. How can this be? Men are in their, what, 60s by this time. Have you ever, can you imagine that? Probably you can. <laughs> it's, the, it's the second wife phenomenon, which happens all too frequently. But, but women rarely have that opportunity at age 60 or so. To to, to do it again. So as a result of this series of studies, which again went over many years and several, many articles, um, only one in three women without uh, children who takes a fast track university job ever become mothers. Uh, women faculty were more than twice as likely as men faculty to indicate they wish they could have had more children. And I have to say, riding here on the plane, just sort of looking up Singapore again, trying to refresh my memory, 
uh, you have a very low birth rate, very low, like 1.2 or something. That's kind of striking. So I assume that this might be a factor as well. Is it harder to have children when you're a professional woman? Is that does that go into it at all, or who knows? Anyway. If married, women are significantly more likely than men to experience divorce or separation. And women who achieve tenure are more than twice as likely than men who achieve tenure to be single 12 years out from PhD. Now, when I, t when I give these talks sometimes to graduate students or postdoc, they bring out the Kleenex at this point. It's very <laughs> upsetting. But then I tell them that, that good things are happening, and they are. So but we'll get to the good things later. Um, I would, can you read this sweatshirt? I can't believe I forgot to have children. <laughs> I don't know if that was popular here, but this was actually a popular sweatshirt during the 1980s. And it was a backlash to the, the women's movement. Uh, you know, women who, who become so professional and, and go it on their own, etc. they're never going to have children. And of course, it wasn't, it wasn't entirely true, but it wasn't totally untrue either, that it did cut down on the, on the fertility for women who did go into these professions. OK, since I, I'm supposed to speak very briefly, <laughs> Um, in this book, <laughs> in this book, have this book again. Mother's on the fast track. Um, this, my daughter. This this book was based on our, our research project, the Do Babies Matter project. So it was had all kinds of you know good data about um, medicine and law and the corporate world and the academic world, but it also had a lot of interviews. Uh, most of them of women who were very successful, like Diane Feinstein, is someone you would know. She was. Um, She's our wonderful woman senator from California. She was the mayor of San Francisco. So most of us feel we know her pretty well. We may not know her personally too well. I know her a little bit personally, but she's a quite, quite an important figure. And then she interviewed a number of high-level CEOs and women in science, et cetera, and then also people who were in the second tier. So she got a full range of it. I wanted her to take on this project. Um, at first, she's a very talented journalist, but I wanted her, as a young woman, I think she was 27 or so when she did this, to just understand the stories that older women had to tell. And she came away really, I think, quite chagrined. She said, I didn't realize it was so difficult, basically. But it was, it was a good, good lesson for her. So this is kind of a, just a capsule of the accumulated wisdom that these women gave us on how they actually managed to do it. What's the strategy, the personal strategies? And don't marry a jerk. Now, this sounds, this actually surprised me because almost all our very successful women said, I really owe it to my spouse. You know, he's such a wonderful supporter and blah, blah. And it turned out, because I thought, this, this can't be true. These women are doing it on their own. How can they go on there? What they really meant, largely, is not that the husband changed the diapers half the time or cooked the meals or took the kids. But the husband f found that their career was as important as their own. So it allowed them the freedom to have the courage to go on and do what they wanted to do. And I hadn't realized before this how important that was, that if you choose the wrong partner, not only do you have children and then worry about them, but to have a, a, a spouse or a partner who is not going to promote you is practically the kiss of death. There's a man in the next room who is my partner, and he is not a jerk. He's been a very good, <laughs> a very good supporter. So this is more. This is important. I think that was the one lesson that that my daughter took away as well, because they said it across the board, which, which surprised me a lot. Um, stay in the game. This is true for all professions. Almost everyone is derailed to some extent by the birth of a child. They, they have to slow down. They're not going to be able to go as fast as they did before. Very few do. So there'll be a period of time, two, a year, two years, five years, whatever, in which they slow down or drop out entirely, depending on what goes on. But if they want to continue in that game, uh, they have to stay in touch, continue to work part-time. I actually had a period, I had a kind of a child-raising job, not career, but I wrote a book. Uh, if you get, if you manage to publish, keep with your society, keep with your friends, keep your face in front of the people who are important to you professionally, then they're going to think about you and you're going to think about them. Losing confidence is the number one th thing that happens to mothers. People who started out as brilliant physicists or brilliant biochemists or whatever, they're out of science for a year, and people say, oh, it's passed you by. You can't possibly come back. You can, nothing you can do. In fact, one of our very big efforts is getting NIH and NSF to do reentry postdocs, which they now are putting in place, so that you don't lose that brilliance, that talent, that experience. And corporations can do this, too, and do. Universities are piss poor, sorry, bad about doing this. They don't do much about inviting people. Once you're out of that track and you're 40 years old as opposed to, uh, or 45 years old as opposed to you know, 38, very, very hard to get in. But it's up to you to stay in the game. Learn mother 
time. And mother time means several things, but largely it means that this is not going to be like this forever. The first few years with children are enormously demanding, but they're not going to stay exactly like that forever. Think in the long frame. Think in the 40-year plan. Have a 40-year plan when you start out, uh, and just don't give up, because giving up and losing confidence and losing contact with your network, your professional network, uh, at least in America, is sort of a guarantee that you'll never have a chance to, to get back to what you really wanted to do or thought you could do. Because young women have no clue, usually, that their lives are not going to unfold the way that men's are. They, they really are unaware of that. Mind your mentor. This is kind of commonplace. Everyone needs a mentor. Most of you probably have a mentor. It can be a man, it can be a woman, and you should mentor others if you're in a position of power. My mentor was a high school, um, not high school, excuse me, a college history professor. And he kept on urging me to try out for this fellowship to get a PhD in history. And, and I said, oh yes, I'm going to apply, I'm going to apply. And then I had to break the news to him that I was actually getting married after after graduation. And I said, you know, I'm really sorry, but I just, just can't do that because I'm getting married. He said, well, so, so what? And, so, and then he managed to embarrass me so much that I applied for the fellowship and did go to graduate school and did manage to do it. And that man made such a difference because it wasn't a time at which women got PhDs so much to give me the confidence and, the, and the, just the push. So make it a point to make someone else uh, your mentee, and if you don't have a mentor, find one, and take a chance on second chances. Uh, fortunately, I think in Singapore, probably more than America, we're in a time in which you have more than one opportunity and things do come up. Sometimes you go backward in order to go forward, but um, it, it's almost a, a, a it's, it's, it's certainly a, all the successful mothers, and, and me too for that matter. I didn't go to the university as a professor until I was in my 40s. I'd done a lot of other things before. Um, but it, it took a lot of courage to become an assistant professor at an older age and a, and a real cut in salary. But sometimes it's the thing to do. You find, you, this is really what I want to do. This is what I have a passion for doing. And I'm just going to make it happen, even if it's at lower rank and I'm going to start someplace. That's just kind of, it seems kind of common sense, but it was so common to all the women that we interviewed. They almost all had experiences like this that I decided to put it down as a, a, one of those wisdom nuts or whatever they are. And then, obviously, you're not going to be able to change the workplace by yourself, much of which, and I, I hear you have a very active women's council here and are actively doing things, <laughs> much of which uh, works means changing the structure of the workplace. And just as in Don't Marry a Jerk, men are very important here as well. Our own story at Berkeley is when we started to get all this data together, we you know, showed it to the chancellors and to the president, whatever, and, and I was the a, a dean, so I had some I had some access, which was good, uh, and we convinced them. It was not too hard to convince because was when you have data, you can convince them that we had to make the tenure track and the whole of the faculty track much more flexible to allow for family needs. Uh, part time tenure track. Now we give uh, both men and women time off. Uh, women get a whole year off teaching and men get a half a year off teaching and men get and women get a stop the clock. Some of these were actually in place when we started our, our, our work but women weren't taking it because they were afraid they wouldn't get tenure or they would look down upon since men weren't taking it. So it can't be just a mummy track. It has to be a parental issue. Now men at Berkeley are taking it all the time. They take their, their parental leave, they take their semester off, they take their stop the clock and it's become like like uh, a Christmas holiday. It becomes an entitlement, something that people do and expect to do and not have to ask to do it, and it's centrally funded. So there are ways in which you can put your, push a culture forward. There are some wonderful corporations like Deloitte Touche. Have you heard the word Deloitte Touche? They do remarkable things to retain and promote their women employees, and most of it has to deal with workplace flexibility. So look at your own workplaces. Figure out what you can do. Sometimes they're very simple and not very expensive. For instance, I went to the chancellor and I said, we have to do uh, maternity leave for our graduate students. They're usually working as TAs or RAs or something because um, they're, they're really, they really can't afford to have babies. And when they do, they drop out and blah, blah, blah. And he said, well, that seems like a good idea. How much will it cost? And I'm no mathematician, but at the back of the envelope, I wrote a number. And the number was really pretty small. He said, oh, I can do that. So cost it out. If you want to change it policy, cost it out ahead of time, make the case of why it's important economically to the institution to keep that person, and then give them the numbers. Make it a package deal so they can't say no. Uh, and as I say, we're having a lot of luck with the agencies now, the federal agencies, changing their policies about uh, parental leaves and reentry postdocs, etc., for scientists, because a huge, huge slide out of the talent pool for women scientists who 
it have been a real uh, investment on the part of the government. They usually spend at least half a million dollars to put them through the PhD and then the postdoc, et cetera, and then they slide right out after childbirth because they're not allowed to come back in two years. So that's been our, our most recent effort with it. All these things have to do with um, basically creating a, a flexible workplace and childcare. Now, one thing I learned last night, I was speaking actually to a group of men, but they pointed out something we don't have in America. You actually have families. You often live near parents and grandparents and people to help you out. It just doesn't happen in America. You're all on your own. And you actually have relatively inexpensive help, which we certainly don't have. So in some ways, if you have that, you have a really good support system already in place, or at least a lot, a lot better than Americans do. <coughs> now, I have to report, this is a very whirlwind trip through through this uh, data, and I haven't gone into how we reformed the system entirely, but we did manage to get a lot of changes made. And these are my grandmother baby pictures. Between the spring of 2003 and the spring of 2009, the number of children born to UC Berkeley assistant professors doubled for women and went up 60% for men. You see in 2003, 73% of the women had no children when they were assistant professors. And then in 2009, only 36% had no children. So the number had, had doubled, and so in men as well. So as I say, these are my baby pictures. You can change a culture. You can actually change it pretty quickly. And in this particular issue, which was enormously important to all of us, I think we've made good headway. So now at the law school, in the hallways, because we've actually hired a lot of young people recently, you'll hear both men and women hanging out in the hallways talking about their child care arrangements. <laughs> or or the, gym, the, 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 the kinder gym that they're going to or whatever. So it, it has changed significantly it just in the last, in my lifetime, the last 10 years. Um, so now I'm very eager to hear from all of you. Thank you. It really occurred to me is that in the United States, you sort of had the discourse first on women's rights, uh, feminism, yes. that underpinned these kinds of yes. changes in structure and behavior. And my sense in Asia is that the discourse is, is quite weak. So what is your, what's your opinion or insight on you know, where you begin? Can you just inject these structural behavioral changes without the discourse, or must we begin here to, to really alter discourse in a more fundamental way? Thank you know, it's interesting because people like my daughter, who you saw last year, she doesn't, she's not a, she's not a progeny of the discourse. She's didn't, she wasn't around during the 70s and 80s to hear all the arguments. So she actually takes it for granted this will happen. And she's outraged when things go badly. So I don't think you need to have all that preliminary discourse about what the problems are, as long as you have the will to change something and you have groups like the Women's Council or, you know, everything, politics is personal, your own university. I've traveled a lot in the United States and spoken at many universities, and it almost always starts with a women's group on campus who wants to make a change. And they're enormously effective if they get themselves together. I always urge them to do a baseline survey and interviews to be able to present the data to whomever and come up with a plan and have numbers attached to it. Um, it's quite possible to change an individual workplace. And then what happens, and this has been very gratifying, because Berkeley did it, then Harvard had to do it and Princeton had to do it because it became a competitive issue. And I sold it as that, too. This is the competitive edge. We're going to get a lot more of these young women who want to come as assistant professors to Berkeley than they do to down the road Stanford if we, in fact, offer them something that there isn't offered there. Now, regrettably, several years later, because Princeton is richer than sin, they, they, they can offer more than anybody else. But still, it has become a competitive issue. And now women who used to hide the fact that they were either had children or were married or whatever, now they openly ask about um, policies, family policies, or, or they've given a brochure just when they enter. These are our family policies. We're here to help you. That has been remarkable to me that it can change too quickly, partly because of free enterprise. It's the notion of these universities competing with each other for the best talent. And that's the argument you use. And it's a good argument. You're, you're going to get your best talent. And you're going to keep your best talent if you have these programs. And they're not that expensive. And they're not impossible. And it really just takes a you know, significant shift in attitude, but it can happen.
Thank you. That's very encouraging. Let's now open the, the floor to questions and uh, please introduce yourself quickly before you ask your question. And make your questions succinct because we only have 20 minutes. <laughs> questions, objections, come on. This is a, this is a well, I'd also like to hear your experiences. I mean, do, have you had uh, or do you know anybody who's had issues of this sort in the workplace? Because I, I, as I say, I'm not familiar with, with the workplace here. and it, Maybe it's not that much different. I just, just don't know. Yes. Claire. Um, hi, I'm Claire Ngo. I, I uh, worked uh, in an investment bank for 13 years, and then um, I got out of the game for a bit, and but then set up my own consultancy to have a bit more flexibility. I don't have immediate family in Singapore, and therefore um, I did feel a responsibility to, to be around for, for my child. Um, I guess my question to you is, having managed many uh, women uh, during my time, um, at, at the investment bank. But what I've noticed is that women have, you know, a propensity to kind of uh, be more risk averse as, as a generalization. And, you know, really needed to be encouraged to kind of get in the game. They're happy with what is as opposed to kind of thinking very aggressively, um, that's what I want, you know, and uh, going after it. Um, I have seen some solutions to it, i.e. through mentors or coaches that encourage them to think big. Um, but generally, and I think probably more so even in Asia than in the U.S., yes. you have this um, tendency, and I'm just curious. To be deferential. Deferential and mm -hmm. also uh, risk averse. Yes. Uh, conservative yes. to some extent. Um, to not be, you know, because uh, I think um, uh, somebody had said, you know, when, when men are aggressive, you know, they're, and uh, they're thought of, you know, as being very ambitious. When women exactly. are aggressive, they're thought as being kind of bitchy. So, you know, there's... Uh, yes, yes. I mean, that's, you put your finger on uh, uh, women who, who have aggressive ideas or, or risk takers are often put down for, for doing that. There's a famous uh, Supreme Court case, Hishon versus Balding, in which a woman was not made a partner in a law firm and they said that, you know, she was all the kinds of things they would have said possibly about men. She was too aggressive. She did this, she did that, she took too many chances and she wasn't, basically she wasn't, this is 1976, she wasn't playing the role that women are supposed to play. Uh, since then, I think they wouldn't say it in the Supreme Court, or, well, it, it was ruled in her favor, but they would not put that in a partner's report, but there's still some truth to that. And when I was the only woman dude for many years, uh, there's no question that you walk a fine line. That doesn't mean, though, that you can't be assertive. And you also find that men play games just to impress each other all the time, and women get things done. You've noticed this, I'm sure, as well. So there, it, it's the game playing thing that, that goes on. Uh, I don't think that overall women are less effective. I haven't seen that. Uh, they may do it differently or more quietly. I think you probably do have, from what I understand in Asian culture, uh, even more resistance to women being assertive, as, we, as we'd like to say, but it's certainly true in America as well. I think your notion of mentorship and leadership um, classes for women uh, is, is really appropriate. Role playing is very good as well. What do you do in this situation works, works very well to give people practice and courage in those situations. Um, but it's, it's a very good observation and by no means limited to Asia. <laughs> But I want to say that women in business. You mentioned you went into consultancy. There was one study. There haven't been that many longitudinal studies on women in business. Uh, but there was one study of MBAs from Stanford, what happened to them, I think, 25 years later. Well, of those that had children, a good number, a very large number, uh, either called themselves starting their own company or consulting. Um, but if you looked at the facts of it, it didn't mean that they were making much money and the companies were awfully small. So it, it turned out to be maybe a good thing for them to do, but certainly not the fast track as they had been before. I don't know your case, but this seems to be um, the trend. The small businesses are started more by women than men, but what kind of small businesses are they? That's always the question. They were not going to be Apple, I'm sure. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they would be Apple, but, but kind of unusually so. So I think for most men and women staying in the corporate structure is the most uh, clear route to success, generally speaking. Yes. Um, my name is Lena Lim. I, I was a librarian turned bookseller turned publisher. <laughs> and, uh, I have Good since, you. Uh, retired and doing things what I want to do <laughs> for a change. I, I enjoyed your talk very much. And was um, I, I'd like to bring up something that you mentioned, that Singapore has 
a very, very low birth rate, 1.2. Mm, it's amazing. Yeah. And uh, considering that Singapore is such a wealthy country, such an educated country, uh, this is quite surprising. And furthermore, we are a country where we have a lot of help, domestic help as well as family help. So why is it that our population is so very, very low? And one of the reasons I think this is so is that we are the only government in the whole world, I think, that publicly says we are a patriarchy society. Do they? Yes, <gasps> they do. And um, this has made a lot of women's groups very unhappy, especially mine. <laughs> I belong to the That's great. That's great. Where is the person from the Prime Minister? Oh, there you are. <laughs> I, I wonder from your perspective and your own yes. view of the world. Yes. Uh, what do you think Singapore can do, Singapore women can right. do, to get ourselves out of the situation? Because whilst the government encourages us to work, they see us only as secondary workers. Yes, the th second tier. Yes, That's right. mm -hmm. the exactly. Second tier, um, yes, you're yeah. acceptable in that, and you probably are in the workplace in huge numbers, just as we are in America. Yeah. Right. That's a very good question, and it, you, you probably watched our, our. I did actually, because it's all over the front page. I can't miss it. The Singapore Times. They have the cabinet up there asking for a lot of money, as I understand. <laughs> front page of the paper. But I, I looked at that cabinet carefully, and did I see any women? No. Okay. I mean, that's one of the things you can do, and which has been pretty successful in the United States, the National Women's Political Caucus, getting women into those situations in government. Um, we, we're, we, now, 30 years ago, we didn't have many women either. Now we have at least a sizable number. Hillary Clinton, of course, is very, very prominent, and there are a lot of other cabinet members who are, who are women. So we have that opened up that greatly. But it's up to you, to some extent, to push those candidates forward. Do you have candidates in your parliament who are women? Do you have, yes, yes. Do, well, why aren't they in the Prime Minister's Cabinet then? I'm asking you, of course. <laughs> uh, the Prime Minister selects his minister. Well, this is a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Based on his judgment of their capabilities. And yeah, no, I know. I mean, that's the same in the United States, but our politicians, <laughs> our politicians have gotten wise about that. They can't get away with not having prominent women in positions. Having said that, our Congress still is only 17% Congresswomen, 17% Senators, still quite low in the political world, but it's very important at all levels to have women in government. Um, and I, I won't write to your Prime Minister, but maybe someone else will. <laughs> Good question. Good question. And the public, the public role and the public face of the country uh, determines a lot about the way women's opportunities. And I think Hillary Clinton was a very major force in that when she was uh, uh, the president's wife as well. She still is. And she still is. Yes, a major force. Yes. And I, she's not going to go away. I expect she'll be vice president next time around. That just you heard this here. I don't know. Just guess. But <laughs> <laughs> there's a there's a comment. Yeah, uh, since the mic is with me, right, so <laughs> good use of it. Okay, uh, to clarify, right, our TFR is 1.15 as of last year, so it's lower than 1.2. Yes, so uh, it's a huh? kind of grave concern on my side. Uh, okay, but that aside, right, um, actually I was wondering, uh, you, Prof, you mentioned something about the law in, the law in Tush. The law in right. Workplace flexibility scheme, right, because um, I was in New York and I visited them. Uh, they share with us their technology and the philosophy behind why they implemented workplace flexibility. So my question to you is, uh, do you think workplace flexibility should be a top-down approach or should it come from the companies and organizations? Well, it can start with the bottom, but ultimately you always have to you always have to have the top on your side and pushing it. And it has to be institutionalized. For instance, me and my group did a lot of research and a lot of advocacy for a number of years, but we're just a, f a few people. But then they have to put in place, which they do, not just um, 
new rules, but new implementers to make those rules work over time. Deloitte Touche is very smart, though, because they also made it a competitive edge for their com company. Women love to go to Deloitte Touche because they have this great they have this great reputation. So having it out there in your literature, your web page, etc., that's one way of institutionalizing things because change can happen and then just disappear when the person leaves. Um, and and the competitive thing is truly important as well. Getting the best talent and getting the best talent means we're going to advertise for flexibility, etc. And we're thinking of you for the whole career, not just for the first few years, blah, blah. There's a way in which you can catch that. The university world is ruthless in the sense it truly eats its young. It doesn't give tenure to a lot of people, not just women. So it's a very tough, tough uh, trial period just at the very front end. But all professions have it to some extent, and some more than others. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm Laura Huang. <coughs> I'm the president of the Singapore Council of Women's Organizations. Um, the Reproduction rate in Singapore is of course of great concern to us, not only from a national point of view, but from a woman's point of view. And I noted with great surprise uh, on a visit to Switzerland that actually um, the Swiss rate of employment of women was higher than Singapore and that their birth rate was higher than Singapore. And this is in a society that doesn't have the kind of uh, help. infrastructure mm -hmm. to help families as we do in Singapore and other parts of the East. We have our close-knit families, we have, we have uh, intergenerational family homes, we have uh, access to home help, which is a real lifesaver. Um, and yet we don't have that, uh, um, uh, uh, how should I say, we, we, we don't have the kind of performance in reproduction that should be uh, higher with all this um, available to us. And I think that if we look at it closely, what is really different in the equation is the way that the fathers uh, mm -hmm. interact with their families. You find that uh, in Switzerland, for example, fathers take it as a matter of course that they are equally responsible. Yes. And if I were to do a, a search monkey survey, I think that if you look at uh, the main reason that deter our young women from starting their families early is the fact that they feel that their careers are very important, they won't be supported by their, their um, spouses enough to make those career achievements possible if they had added on uh, children as well. So I think, you know, very often when we talk about these matters, it's like, it's like preaching to the converted. And what we need to do is to really take the message out of just the women's arena and make it a family situation. It's a national situation that has to be addressed yes. in the workplace and also in mental attitudes. Um, I actually sit on the board of a, an association called the Center for Fathering. Uh, you may not have heard for it, okay. but I think it's very important, and it's not a sperm bank, <laughs> which I'm very often asked. Oh, is this a sperm bank? No, I couldn't contribute very much <laughs> if it was so. But really, it's, it's an, an organization um, that was put up by, by some really forward-thinking guys. Well, really dedicated fathers to bring the message across that fatherhood is essential in, 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 in families and that they're essential in their children's lives. And I think it's those messages, those positive messages that we have to get out. And uh, you know, I hope that there will be positive results uh, on a national level as well. Thank you. <laughs> that's, that's very well spoken, and, and, yeah. and I, I'm really impressed that you're doing this here. We have a similar struggle in the United States. As I mentioned, women are really pretty much equal breadwinners, but it doesn't, doesn't always translate that way. Men still feel obliged. Younger men, however, routinely on surveys say that they would like to be equal partners for raising children, but somehow or another when it comes to the workplace, they just don't do it, or the workplace doesn't make it so possible. But congratulations to the group who's doing it here. That's, that's very good, the, the father's group. Um, I want to ask another question, unless there's someone else in the audience that I want to yield to. Okay. Just, just a very short, uh, just a very short comment. It's, it's okay. I'm used to speaking loudly. Um, just for women in this room who have who have children, 
I do hope you're raising your sons in a way that you expect <laughs> your daughter's husbands to be. Just, just a, you know, an observation comment. Good advice. Very good advice. <laughs> I just want to ask if you could comment more broadly on this issue of bringing the men on board. Yes, this, yes. This is in the literature, actually, that we that we need to understand the, the loss. That there's all these words used in loss, men, field, yes. threat, etc. Yes. How has that been dealt with in the Western context? Well, again, uh, personal is political, so the way we've done it at UC is, is to make it um, not just attractive for men to take these leaves, uh, but to give them a fair number of incentives to do so. So it's been it's been kind of top down to encourage it to start, and then it becomes it becomes it becomes an entitlement, and it becomes something they do. I do think there is a shift, and in, in other workplaces as well. But it is the most important battle. You put your finger on it to get fathers involved. That's why "Don't marry a jerk" is really a major one. I mean, that covers a lot of territory. That means your home, not just the workplace. It means how do you how do you handle things in your own home, or how do you handle your sons, which are very good observations as well. But I think that in some ways in the United States, that's the last major barrier because we actually have women in education, we have women here, there, but they're not going to go any further, and it's never going to be equal unless men play a, an equal. Uh, a role. You're absolutely right about that. And it is the hardest one. <laughs> we have time for maybe one more question. I mean, um, what's your advice on us choosing our mentors? Ah, that's a good question. I mean, mentors happen at different times in life. You might have one when you are uh, a student. Uh, but probably the most effective ones are those who are in your own profession. For instance, if you're in a, in a corporation, find a senior person. Ideally, it would be a woman because they understand these issues, but it isn't always going to be a woman. So sometimes men, in fact, our chancellor at Berkeley, uh, he's been enormously active in promoting women in science because he has a daughter who's a doctor and he sees it through his daughter's eyes. That will be a great conversion for some of the senior management if they have a daughter who's also struggling with these issues. So don't give up on men. Uh, do you have any, <laughs> do you have any, at Berkeley we have a group called, um, especially the faculty women's group, and every year when the new assistant professors come in, uh, older women, senior women, um, are basically given a mentee to out of their department to spend time with, to show them the ropes, etc., uh, and to make it institutionalized. I don't know if your institutions do that. The older, more senior executive women can do this for the, the newcomers. There are many ways to organize it, and it's not that hard, it's, and some people do it quite well, uh, and it's very effective because everything is always more powerful in groups than it is in individuals. So if you can have a group who, who offers themselves as mentors, I think that's also wonderful. And that's pretty easy to make happen, because people are usually willing, if they're asked to do something like that, rarely they would say, oh, terrible idea, I just can't <laughs> Because they will remember that they've had mentors, or this is important. Men do networking better, or generally have in the past. And I think that's, when I was practicing law, I always called it kind of the locker room effect, because the lawyers would come in on Monday, and they'd talk about what the Niners, or the Ath Oakland A's, or what the, what the football teams had done. The major topic of conversation was what the sporting teams had done. And that is a form of networking and conversation that women ge generally don't, but not always, feel as comfortable with. So uh, getting in, it, so it always seems as if men run in packs because they're talking about sports all the time. They're just uncomfortable talking about anything else, right? <laughs> uh, so get, trying, to, trying to get over that is probably going to be difficult with men, but having other women to talk to where you do have more common ground usually works well for mentors. Yeah, there should be a water cooler talks on purses, for example. <laughs> there, water cooler there you go. Um, uh, we, have, we actually have two more minutes. Is there <laughs> one more? Any, any other questions? I'd love to hear some more personal experiences because that really is uh, really things that I, I I will even write columns about to tell you the truth. <laughs> I write a, a regular column for the Chronicle of Higher Education on the Balancing Act, so I could talk about my visit to Singapore if I got a little more juice from somebody. <laughs> In any insights, Angela, you mentioned one of the policy changes and that it didn't cost very much, and that was one yes. of the reasons it came through. I'm just wondering on the, on the, on the flip side of that, so the, the increases in productivity, as you say, the stats are very important. Did you, in the end, find some statistics at UC Berkeley at the end of all of this that showed the productivity gains? You know, that's a very good question because it's, it's been relatively recent, uh, and we do have now 
an NSF grant to look just at that, to assess the difference, how much it costs for all these new policies, and what effectiveness they've had. And that's truly important, too. They have done this at Iowa State and came out positively. I guess you can hard to know what they were measuring exactly, but it's important to have those kinds of studies. But you have to have things in place for a while to do them. And I certainly recommend, I mean, that's the kind of data which is so valuable and will be easily publishable if anyone is interested in doing it in any way. Uh, but you can make your case in many ways. I mean, one is the productivity, the other is the att attracting the best talent, maintaining that there are different ways of, of what the advantage is. But it's important. <laughs> Actually, I think I will write a call and it'll be about Singapore has it all. They have, they have um, people, they have grandmothers and mothers and aunts, and they have household help, but they have no children. <laughs> Maybe because you're really asking for an anecdote, and this is a, this is a true story. Okay. Um, I got pregnant with my third baby unexpectedly here in Singapore, and then I looked at the HR policy of NUS. And it said that if you're not Singaporean and it's your third child, you get zero maternity leave. Uh, uh -huh. If you're not Singaporean. I did uh -huh. a double take. Is, is this real? So I asked the HR twice. Yes, it's real. You, you get zero maternity leave if you're a foreigner and it's huh. your third child. Huh. I was so offended by this that I went to my boss and I said, consider the onset of labor my notice of resignation. So, so this is again in a university setting. Wow. I, I, I was shocked, and maybe this is something you know. I haven't raised it to the president of the U.S. for lack of time, but, but <laughs> <laughs> so we don't have everything in Singapore. And I think uh, you know, I'm, I'm sharing this anecdote, but uh, we can continue the conversation, obviously. But I want to thank you on behalf of everyone here for your own courage and your own you know innovative thinking in doing all of this at a time when you know this may not have been very easy and data is, uh, is very powerful. Thank you for reminding us of that again. And we will certainly take a lot of these insights and try to you know use them in our own um, fight and in our own successes here in Singapore, hopefully more successes. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mason and Dr. Timonez, for the engaging and discussion. I would like to invite our Angela Chapman up to present the tokens of appreciation for our speaker and chair. So on behalf of, uh, of NUS and the Greater Good series, thank you so much, Marianne. That was absolutely delightful, very insightful. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And Astrid for doing such a great job. Thank you very thank much. Hi everyone! We hope you've enjoyed your lunch so far. May we now invite uh, Ms. Yongfi Hui of UBS to share the changing face of philanthropy in the 21st century. Mrs. Yong is Managing Director and Senior Advisor at UBS Wealth Management. She has over 20 years of experience in both public as well as the private sectors and is currently actively involved in various philanthropic initiatives and organisations such as the Singapore Chinese Chamber of Commerce and Industry and the Community Foundation of Singapore. Can you please join me to welcome Mrs. Yong. Thank you. Before I start, I would like to say a very warm welcome to all of you on behalf of UBS. Um, for those of you who have not taken a tour of the building, you're very welcome to do so after lunch. This is a very historical place and we are so privileged and so honoured that we are able to lease it uh, for our use and for the use of our clients and friends. A lot of history was made in this building and it is certainly our hope that as we occupy this place with our friends like yourselves, we will also be making history and with the initiation of the Greater Good series with the NUS, we certainly hope that what we do here today with you will inspire some history in the making, whether it's advancing the cause of women or in advancing uh, philanthropy in the region and in Singapore. So thank you very much NUS for allowing us to be part of this and it is really our honour to partner you in this. Thank you. Okay, today we are going to talk about the changing face of Asian philanthropy and we would like to share with you the insights that UBS has gained working with philanthropists globally. We have a team of 30 experts 
engaging in 70 countries worldwide. So we hope uh, it will be an interactive uh, session and I'm as keen to share and learn from you of your experiences. But before we talk about Asia, let us talk about the global trends. Globally, I think one of the main trends that we have witnessed emerging is the move from checkbook philanthropy, in other words, just writing a check, to a more strategic and engaged form of philanthropy. And we believe strongly that this is something that we will also witness in Asia. Today's philanthropist comes mainly from an entrepreneurial mindset and they look to build alliances, leverage public and private co-finance. Today's philanthropists are pragmatic and they're prepared to experiment while focusing on long-term impact. And apart from a business mindset, the philanthropists are also bringing the tools and techniques of business directly to bear on social problems. You will hear more about concepts like impact investing where we are bringing the discipline of the financial markets to the monitoring and evaluation of philanthropic investment. And we are also seeing trends where donors are seeking to unleash the power of creative and committed individual change makers through support of social entrepreneurship. And lastly, the skills and capabilities of the private sector are being imported wholesale into the philanthropic world. For example, in the branding and the marketing of philanthropic fundraising. And of course, no one has done more to create this new environment than Bill Gates, who typifies the new approach. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation demands business-like planning, accountability and transparency and has transformed the global philanthropy landscape over the last 10 years. So for us in UBS, we were really keen to ask the trends we witness globally, will we see them in Asia? Or maybe we in Asia can also lead some of the emerging trends. In sheer numbers, it is always useful to remind ourselves that most people still living in absolute poverty are living in Asia. We can sometimes forget that because a huge number of people in East Asia have been lifted out of poverty, that many are still living close to the poverty line. Rapid growth in Asia has been a massive force for good, but has also created tensions due to increasing economic inequality especially in societies which values social cohesion. So building philanthropy in Asia is important. And it is important not just because the resources are increasingly found in Asia as we grow richer. It is also important because the heart of the problem is also here. And the solutions increasingly must come from Asia itself. To date, there has been a lack of reliable information regarding philanthropy in the region, partly because of the deeply ingrained sense of humility and shyness of publicity. Many of the philanthropists have chosen to remain anonymous. Here, we again have to thank Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and others who have created an era of public philanthropy, showing that effective communication can help to leverage further support from others. Sensing a new openness, two years ago, we initiated the first major cross-country study of family philanthropy in Asia in partnership with INSEAD. Through our network, we were privileged and honored to be able to engage through 200 philanthropists, thought leaders and organizations in the study. Contributions to the study include the Sampona family of Indonesia, the Charavanon family in Thailand, and the Lian family in Singapore. So 
So you might all ask, what are the key findings of the study? The first major finding that we saw was the importance of affiliation. Whether it's local, national, ethnic or religious, the sense of community remains a central tenet of philanthropy in Asia and it would appear greater, to a greater degree than other parts of the world. Singapore actually stands out as the exception where a considerable amount of our giving goes to international courses. But the overwhelming bulk of giving in Asia stays in Asia and China is the other exception where almost all the giving is in China. So for those of us hoping for greater engagement with philanthropists in Asia, this dynamic needs to be understood. When we ask the question, what are your personal motivations to philanthropy? Our philanthropist in the study cites the main reason as the need to create a legacy and to transmit family values. We have seen through our conversations and through our work with them that engaging in philanthropy through families allows the families to develop cohesion within and across generation and developing capabilities and creating significant roles for family members. And sometimes this is so important in big Asian families where they may not be able to sit around a table to discuss business, but when they have common philanthropic objectives, you'll find that they can have a good conversation. And what is the benefits of bringing the family together? The benefits, as I've said, is to really bring families across generations and within generations. But very often, intergenerational differences can also be a source of tension. First-generation philanthropists in Asia, we found, have a vastly different life experience and outlook from their successes. Often, first-generation philanthropists are driven by a first-hand awareness of deprivation from their own childhood or from extended family experience. They give from the heart often with an internal spiritual motivation regarding giving as a good in itself. The new next generation philanthropists are often more globalized in outlook. They are concerned more that their giving can be seen to make a real measurable difference in an area of defined need. They look for new underserved areas in which to give and they look for new ways of giving. They are very obvious in their pragmatism and they look for sustainability and scalability. Managing these differences would appear to be key to successful multi-generational philanthropy in Asia. And this is also a lot of the work that we do with our clients. And what is the most favoured cause among our participants? Education. And there are many reasons for this, both cultural and historical. The idea that it's better to teach a man to fish than to give him a fish is deeply ingrained in Asia. And at the same time, many of the first generation Asian philanthropists have themselves benefited from educational giving or else had to struggle to overcome educational disadvantage so they know the importance. The result then is a wonderful wellspring of support for education that institutions such as NUS can continue to count on in the future. We believe that forward-looking institutions like NUS will seek to develop education excellence and provide philanthropists with access and opportunities through innovative partnerships across geographies, sectors and organisations. When we ask the philanthropists what they see as their core challenge, the number one cited by them is fundraising and finding core 
investors. Perhaps this should not be a surprise. Asia's philanthropists are often entrepreneurs and approach their philanthropy in an entrepreneurial fashion. Certainly, charitable fundraising is in its infancy in the region, compared to the US, where models such as cost-related marketing are increasingly the norm. We believe there's a huge opportunity for growth in this area in Asia. And looking around the room, I can see many of you have experience in the difficulties of fundraising. May, may, excuse me for interrupting. Yes. May I ask the 33% there in blue, mm -hmm. what, what uh, factors or variables are captured under that other category? Because it's quite large. Um, oh, there's a whole variety of factors, including difficulty of finding the right people. Um, yeah, and wide variety of factors. If you're interested, we can share with you the details later. Cost-related marketing is a new trend that we have observed in the United States and has been particularly successful in an initiative called Product Red. It's superbly branded using online and traditional media and it ties together grassroots and celebrity advocacy in support of funding for AIDS program in Africa. As well as advocacy and awareness of the cause, the campaign has generated more than 180 million US dollars through partnerships with brands such as Nike, Coca-Cola and Starbucks. We believe that this kind of smart integrated market for charitable courses will increasingly become the norm in Asia in the coming years as the sector matures and become more professional. Becoming more professional, we believe, is the critical challenge facing philanthropists across Asia. Singapore was found to have the highest proportion of professionally managed foundations among those we surveyed. And significantly, it is these professionally run organisations that make the highest proportion of grants to third party organisations, rather than do-it-yourself approaches which may often end up reinventing the wheel. Philanthropists in Asia are often concerned to keep overhead and management costs down to an absolute minimum. While this is a laudable principle in theory, we believe that philanthropists will learn in the coming years that it's better to appreciate that the right level of investment in management can yield dividends with increased social impact. Social entrepreneurship and values-based investing is also cited as a key emerging trend in our study with INSEAD. Because, quite simply, there is an awareness that traditional philanthropy is no longer enough. The needs are just too great, especially at the bottom of the pyramid. In Asia especially, where the numbers can be so large, the issues of scalability and sustainability are particularly important. And increasingly, next generation philanthropists in Asia are looking at with profits models to address these issues. One model which shows particular promise to us is impact investing, which has been championed by the Rockefeller Foundation and others in recent years. Impact investing generates measurable social and environmental impact alongside financial returns, providing capital to private businesses which drive social development. Now because we believe that this is really going to be a major emerging trend, we would like to share with you a video that better explores this idea. After decades of intensive development aid, still around a billion people suffer from hunger or malnutrition have no economic perspective and no access to healthcare. And the outlook is alarming. Most of the UN Millennium Goals are currently not on track or even deteriorating. In the struggle for positive change, philanthropy plays an important role. But to bring the economy and society of poor countries forward, it needs much more. The times of checkbook development aid are over. To resolve the world's most pressing challenges, more sustainable approaches are needed.
to unite both social development and financial return. Rather than donations, the future of development lies in investments that enable private businesses to drive social advancement. Local, small, and medium enterprises are the literal cornerstones of development. When they're doing well, they drive a cascade of positive impact for society. If we want to change our world in fundamental and lasting ways, we can't depend purely on charitable donations. Rather, economic self-sufficiency must be the goal. This means that investments in developing countries must not only achieve a measurable impact, they also have to pay back the investor. This combination of doing business while doing good represents an emerging investment style called impact investing. To be successful in investing in local business, it needs a lot. So far, it has been a niche approach with high transaction costs. And to date, there are no diversified financial products on the market. The gentleman you saw, Alex, he was the former chief financial officer of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And he joined UBS only last year. And he is actually a very keen advocate for the new concept of impact investing. And he's been sharing with us why he's so interested in this topic. Now, for those of us who are involved in boards or work with endowments and foundations, we always say that every year we may um, try to achieve an investment return and donate, say, 4 or 5% of our endowment or funds. Now, this 4 or 5% goes to charities and philanthropic causes, and they are like gone, right? And then you hope to invest the remaining 95% to grow the fund or to at least maintain its value. So he is saying, with the needs so great in the world, why don't I think of how I can better use the remaining 95% of our funds to achieve some social impact? And if he can achieve that with the Gates Foundation, we are talking about a lot of money rather than just 5% a year. So that was a genesis of his interest and he started experimenting with it in the Gates Foundation. Then he decided, why not join an organization that has an even uh, greater pool of funds to influence? And we hope and we trust that that's one of the main reasons why he decided to join us. The reason why I'm spending a little bit of time talking about impact investing is because there's a trend identified by our philanthropist participants in the study but also because we really do believe that it's something that we'll hear about more often in the future. And there's nothing better to illustrate what's happening than to share with you an actual example that, uh, that we, we know. There's an institution called Obvium, which has been managing funds for the Swiss government for the last 10 years. And they manage the Swiss National Development Fund. And what they do is they make relatively small investments and through those small investments they have contributed to the creation of 170,000 jobs in developing countries in the last 10 years. And these investments are made in small and medium enterprises in high impact sectors such as health, education, clean energy and thereby raising living standards and opportunity. And here is an example. In a poor rural area of Peru, small farmers, they found, were trapped in a cycle of poverty. They had few options to sell their fresh produce, which of course decay within days. Now the fund made an investment of only 2.2 million US dollars in 2005 to expand a local food processors business. That company, using the funds, upgraded its facilities and added cold storage and dehydration plants. As a result of that, after five years, the company is now employing more than 3,000 employees and sourcing fresh produce from over 450 regional farmers. And today, it's capable of absorbing close to 100% of the local supply by freezing or drying mangoes and has diversified into other products such as avocados and pineapple, generating a steady flow of income to the farmers and their workers. This company has now grown to be one of the largest mango exporters in Peru 
and the value of the original investment increased by 2.6 times over five years. This poor community, on the one hand, is now experiencing a better future. And on the other hand, the fund manager achieved a pretty good return on, in, on its investment. This is the essence of impact investing. And if we are able to successfully replicate this model in Asia, I think it will solve some of the challenges with regards to sustainability and scalability. So we in UBS are actually very excited to be part of this trend and to support the growth of this particular aspect of philanthropy in Asia. And on that note, I welcome you to share with us your own experiences and to take any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Young. Any questions? After your clients, any kind of pushback? any kind of pushback in terms of all the professionalization and institutionalization and bringing in private sector, you know, kind of metrics, et cetera, in terms of um, particularly with the first generation um, departing too much from the heart and the essence of giving? Um, I, I think this is really at the heart of what we said about managing the intergenerational differences and the tension. Um, and that's a lot of the work that we are facilitating to kind of provide forums for these issues to be discussed. And frankly, there's no right or wrong answer. It depends on individual families and, and the individuals working there. But, but we, we believe in our work, and we have seen that, is that if there is a happy balance, then um, they can actually do a lot more. But certainly, it is a tension. And we, we kind of provide, we hope to provide forums for these issues to be explored. But I don't think there is a, a right or wrong answer, which is better, yeah. But certainly the newer generation um, are very keen to, to scale their efforts, yeah, and are interested in solving big problems. Yes? I, I work with UBS and I'm in the unit uh, one of, the, one of the branches of our unit actually uh, dealt with the philanthropy piece. Um, the philanthropy survey that we did with INSEAD, um, in that survey we actually surveyed over 200 people, or where over 200 people respond to our survey, and we interviewed over 100. Um, there is a nice report, a full report out, and, and if you're interested, please do let me know. Uh, that actually showed very clearly the point that you made, that the senior generation is thinking about philanthropy in quite a different way from the younger generation. And um, I think the way the different, uh, especially uh, families, deal with this is that they have a dual branch so that um, you, you don't accept their apple cart, but the younger generation starts having uh, a different philanthropic program that's quite separate from, so, so the old philanthropy continues while the younger ones um, start doing something different. And I think you see that in uh, the model which the Myers family in Australia practice as well, where each generation also has some different. Perhaps, uh, Rockefeller, uh, it, would you have something to share on that side? Yes. Is Rockefeller Foundation here? No? No? Okay. Laura, you do a lot of voluntary work. Do you have some experience to share in this uh, different generation looking for different causes, Stefan? I think that um, our main, uh, what, what I would like to say most is that it gets harder every year for us to go and fundraise. Um, I think that there's a question of um, donor fatigue, for one, because you're always going to the same corporations, the same individuals, the same foundations. Uh, and the other thing is that um, I think also because there seem to be so many more uh, fundraising activities yes. from all, all sectors, you know, education for sure, um, you have children's issues, uh, old people's issues, women's issues, men's issues. So everything becomes uh, a, a cause to go and fundraise. Um, I think every school has their fundraising program. And those are children in school. You're forever fundraising for your school, right? So I think what I, 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 I wish you could see is some um, form of uh, discipline. <laughs> Um, in, in the sense that, can we have 
more buy-in to a community fund that can raise the, 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 the kind of um, uh, uh, donations that are needed for a variety of projects. Uh, that will save individuals from having to go out competing against you, know, you against me because your son's school might, you know, <laughs> but, but, uh, um, So I, I, if we can look more at a community giving and a community fund that can look after a bigger variety of, of, uh, of situations, that, that really I think would mm. be good for our future. Mm. Well, thank you for that suggestion. I think that's one of the reasons why I uh, got involved with the Community Foundation of Singapore. It's still a relatively new institution, but I think one of the objectives is really they, they are interested in seeing how it can be more efficient in matching donors with uh, recipients. Yeah. Yes. I have a question on impact investing. Yes. Um, just your clients or high net worths. What percentage of their portfolios are, are, are they actually willing to allocate to impact investing? Because um, obviously, I think generally investors want to maximize returns, and and you have this, you know, the the dual thing. So, I mean, and it's not new anyway. And you look at Ben and Jerry. Basically, <laughs> that company was impact in investing. Uh, maybe other companies like Patagonia. But w what percentage of their their portfolios are they willing to allocate to something like that? Mm. That's a very good question, and it's um, I don't have an answer right now because it's. While some institutions have uh, done it, like Ben and Jerry, I think in terms of um, it being accepted by the broader philanthropic community, I think it's still in its uh, infancy. So, so we are actually in the process of having conversations with clients on this very subject. So I don't think I have an answer for you I mean, right now. Fact? I just wonder if yeah. investing is a fact. Okay, um, that's a, uh, uh, one way to think about it. But, you know, if, if we take the example uh, cited by our chief investment officer based on his experience with the Gates Foundation, I think he makes a compelling point that, you know, if we right now foundations donate, say, 5% of their funds every year to causes, the 95% are just being invested for return. If you can somehow find a way to strike a balance between also investing those 95% of the funds remaining to earn a good return and yet achieve social impact, the impact can be leveraged so many times. And we have seen through the example, like the one I cited in Peru, where you can actually have good social impact as well as good financial return. So these are some of the activities I think is worth exploring and if it works, it really can be sustainable. But that's the challenge, finding enough investments that do both. Any other challenges any of you might face in uh, this area? You know, funding for women causes is also, although it's not uh, one of the priorities. I'm for funding. <laughs> <laughs> and let's just say that mine will have huge social impact. <laughs> Yeah, but I think funding for women causes is also something that uh, some of us are passionately involved in. So, well, on that note, I wish you a good afternoon. Oh, sorry, Jun. Oh, but if, um, if, if there are no other questions, I'd like to take up the question on the impact investing. Actually, that also uh, addresses what Laura mentioned about uh, donor fatigue. Um, the concept, the theory behind impact investing is that uh, if you are able to invest um, in in companies where the measure, the measurement of the success is also defined in impact terms. And in fact, the, uh, there is a Rockefeller um, standard, I think, of measuring impact, social impact. So in, in impact investing, that is one of the, when, that's one of the benchmarks, other than the financial return. It's also to ensure that all these uh, companies that you invest in have that social return criteria that's specified. And then if these companies are able to themselves make a profit and meet some of the criteria, the criteria uh, could be things like job creation. It could be, you know, it's all measurable. The way we in the commercial world are used to measuring in concrete numbers. 
um, if it's education, it's number of kids put through school, it's uh, number of schools built, whatever it is that uh, this organization or this company sets itself out as its business plan has that strategic uh, social agenda and measurement terms in it as well. Then if they are able to be profitable, then that's self-sustaining. They don't have to get, go out and, and ask for more funding. That feeds itself. Now on the other hand, if the investor then gets his return, then the investor can put that return into another social, mm. uh, uh, another impact uh, area and have that propagate as well. Um, as for the question on the percentage that's allocated there, I think it depends very much on how your impact investing is structured. Uh, in some of these cases where, where, um, where we found that it makes the both best impact and in the example which Pickford gave, it's really companies which are so small and in areas which are so perhaps underdeveloped or they do not have sufficient of a financial market infrastructure, they cannot get long-term loans. So, you know, you cannot build a big plant if your loans are only for, you know, no more than one year. How are you going to pay it back? So therefore, those types of impact investing tend to be long-term. So it would take more than nature of private equity. So if you think of it in how your investment portfolio is structured, the private equity portion cannot be too high because it's not liquid. So again, I, I don't like fake fee, I don't have the exact numbers, but conceptually, that's how it works. And so these are some of the dynamics there, uh, which cause us to believe that it, it's something worth going deeper into and looking into. Yeah. Thank you, June. And just to add on that, you know, in the West, it has not really taken off in a great way because the West is very established in terms, philanthropies are very established in the West in, in the sense that they set up different teams to do these two activities. You have one team to do investments to maximize return and another team to do the grant making. And never the twain will meet. Whereas in Asia, because philanthropy is still evolving and, and relatively new, I think we actually may have a better chance to, to make the two work together because we still do, I mean, the patriarch is used to thinking in terms of investment and also grant making all within, all by himself. So it's actually something that I do believe if we structure it right and communicate it right, it actually can be more effective and take off in a bigger way than in the West. So this is something we, I personally am very excited about. Okay, in that case, it leaves me to thank you uh, for coming and uh, wish you a good afternoon and thank you once again NUS and Dr. Mason for a wonderful speech. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Yong. We hope that you've enjoyed today's session. The next event in the NUS Greater Good series will be on February 2nd with the Venerable Tenzin Priyadashi, founding director of the Dalai Lama Centre for Ethics and Transformative Values at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, a non-partisan collaborative think tank focused on interdisciplinary research programs related to the development of human and global ethics. He will be speaking on philanthropy in the context of value-based leadership and its impact on the community. If you are interested to attend this uh, session, please um, indicate uh, to my colleagues at the reception as you leave. Thank you for coming and have a pleasant afternoon.